Are the dominoes falling? Welcome to Hawkeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. We come your way typically every Tuesday, but uh, needed to make some schedule changes this week. So we appreciate you following us to Friday here with, of course, the guy that makes this show possible, Corey Brada from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Whether you follow men's or women's basketball and, of course, Iowa football, head on over to from the Hawkeye of the Storm and check out Corey's work covering Iowa athletics. Corey, how are you? Good. How are you, Mark? I am doing just fine. I am doing just fine. And of course, we're not going to run from a situation that's not in any way, shape or form uh, solidified. It's just basically connecting dots that could come into play, could be connected at some point or may not. Um, so if for those of you who maybe have been working or out today and have not seen the news, Former Michigan offensive coordinator Josh Gaddis has been dismissed from his offensive coordinator duties at Miami. And of course, Josh Gaddis uh, was the coordinator at Michigan when Cade McNamara was the starting quarterback and they won a Big Ten championship and went to the college football playoff. Eric All at tight end as well. And Iowa has its struggles on the offensive side of the ball. Needless to say, I think we've discussed that once or twice. Um, of course, Brian Ferentz still has a job as the offensive coordinator at Iowa. And as long as he does, that um, is the way things stand. But um, here we are. And certainly we welcome your comments and questions in the live chat. And we will take them um, over the next 60 minutes or so. I want to just address the elephant in the room first here, uh, Mark. I don't have any inside information that suggests that Gaddis is coming to Iowa. Okay. Um, I tweeted something. I, I tweeted an emoji this morning. They got apparently got some people riled up, and apparently that means there's some secret meaning behind an emoji. Uh, in reaction to the news, Mark, y- you just brought it up. The, the Gaddis discussion is valid because he was Cade's offensive coordinator, and he's on the market. He, he is. He is. Regardless of what you want to talk about his personal past, and we've talked about that. You and I have been upfront about rumors about you know him and a possibly some immorality going on potentially that's i don't know if that's been validated that's true regardless but we're talking about resume on the football field and although he had a bad year at miami he was a broils winner last year in 2021 and the bottom line is he was Cade mcnamara's oc at michigan and by the way we can talk about like potential scenarios if, if we're if the bottom line is Brian Ferentz is still employed and you already mentioned that he, he's still the OC and the more time that goes by, and I've been saying this for three weeks. I've been saying for three weeks or more, I think there's a decent shot. We get a change there. However, as time goes on, especially now that that Bill O'Brien move occurred, you know, him getting hired by new England. Now that that move was, has basically been made up. I don't know that new England's, have they actually announced that formally yet. I don't know that they have, but but Adam, I believe it was Adam Schefter that reported it. So it's 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 happening. Obviously, now that that's happening, the clock is ticking, and the more time that goes by, the less likely, in my opinion, the less likely it is that Brian goes anywhere. And if I told you three weeks, I think I did tell you three weeks ago that I thought there was a, a decent shot he leaves, based on what I was hearing. I would say there's a, a less less of a chance now. I'm not going to close that door until Kirk Ferentz gets on the podium and says, "We this is who we are. this is our staff. We're not making any changes." And I'm going to still say, Mark, there's a, an opportunity, a, a chance that he leaves. And there have been rumblings that there have been there has been interest by some NFL teams. Uh, to what extent, and certainly what positions are open, or even I mean, you know, just because there's interest doesn't mean he's getting job offers. Those are all things we don't know. I can tell you, we had Brad Heinrichs, uh, who's the head of the Swarm Collective, Iowa's primary NIL collective, had him on an episode of Hawkeye Hangout on Wednesday. And Brad is very in touch, as you could well imagine, very in touch with the program and very in touch with the head coach of the program and the coordinators of the program. He knows all the coaches personally. Uh, He does not believe we're going to get a change. Now, I've been saying this for a long time. Um, I think there's a chance. That's why I still hold out that 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 glimmer. I shouldn't say glimmer because it's that possibility that potentially you could still get a change even this late into into January, maybe even into February. 
is because I think there's a chance that potentially Kirk and and Brian and the staff are going to keep this completely under wraps, that there are attempts to actively move Brian on until he actually gets a job. I mean, I, I don't know that uh, there would be any reason for Kirk to withhold that from from anybody that matters, but also why would you tell anybody at this point? Because there's no guarantees. I, that if, if that's still, if there's still an active um, attempt to find Brian work somewhere in the league, there's a chance it doesn't happen. So why would you want people to know that? Um, so that's what I would say to people who are closed, have closed the door on it because we're this late in the game and nothing's happened. And, you know, there are sources out there. I mean, we had, again, Brad Heinrichs, a great, great guy, well, well-respected guy, great leader of the swarm. And he's, he's in firm belief that, that I was going to retain Brian and keep him as the OC. That may very well happen, but I'm not going to shut the door on that potential until Kirk Ferentz gets up there. And there have been rumors. He was rumored to be scheduling a press conference this week. Didn't happen. Now I'm hearing maybe next week. That's the rumor. So I don't know what we're going to get. I can also tell you a pretty credible source told me here a couple days ago that Brian was scheduled to meet with Gary Barda to restructure the contract, his contract this week, potentially even today. I was told Friday the 27th. So if that's happening, then that would indicate to me that he's probably coming back. Um, and I know people want answers, Mark. They want answers from the people that matter, the beat writers and you know, they, they want Brad Heinrichs to be able to tell him, yes, he's absolutely coming back. Brad's pretty confident. I can tell you that. But I'm just saying nobody, including myself, nobody is going to be able to tell you for absolutely certain is Brian coming back, except probably Gary Barta, Kirk Ferentz, or Brian Ferentz, and maybe none of them. Because, again, we may still be waiting on moves in the league. I still think there's a chance that could occur at this point. So here's a few aspects of this scenario from my vantage point. One is that, as we discussed a few weeks ago, you can have valid sources and those valid sources could be on point and things still break down if a number of dominoes have to fall for a certain situation to come to fruition. You know, they may have a plan to uh, look for a new offensive coordinator if they are able to uh, look for a spot and find a spot for Brian. And if that doesn't come through, then the fallback may not be, we're going to let him go. The fallback may be in the default is that we are going to continue with him as offensive coordinator. Uh, this is a valid conversation for everything that we outlined right off the top. We're looking at an offensive coordinator who won the Broyles award, uh, who now is on the open market who was the offensive coordinator for the current starting quarterback and tight end. And there's a connection to the big 10 as well. Um, what's interesting to me is uh, just the evaluation of Josh Gaddis. Um, forget the off the field possible issues. They've not been substantiated as far as I know, but they're out there. Uh, but just looking at the on field performance Here's a coach who won the Broyles award last or in 2021. Then he goes to Miami and they underperform considerably. They have a quarterback coming back who had one of the best TD to pick ratios in the nation and was on the ascent. And he had a horrible season under Josh Gaddis. Uh, they just underperformed in every such way. Uh, and they and, and it also looked to be a fit from a stylistic standpoint, moving from Michigan, Jim Harbaugh, run first, power running attack, hard play action to Mario Cristobal, who is very much in that same mindset as the former offensive lineman of the style of offense that he runs. It calls into question for me how much Josh Gaddis actually ran that offense that won the Broyles Award for him in 2021 in regards to it, it looks like a Jim Harbaugh offense to me. Uh, and, and again, that's just, that's just a, a comment aside. I don't know, not diagnosed it. I don't know exactly what's going on. Of course, at practice and so forth. Uh, then you the remember, other, you, you remember him at Penn state and Alabama. I mean, how much influence do you think he was? Did, did those, did those offenses look more like what you would expect from, Gaddis, given his resume? 
Well, when he was at Al Alabama, that's when, after they had made a big transformation from what you would consider a pro style offense to a, you know, high octane, spread the field, throw it 40 or 45 times a game look. And that was mostly credited to Lane Kiffin making those changes at Alabama. The the other curious thing that you bring up, and it's it's totally true about not this situation only, but all situations, is the running time clock. Uh, because basically, we, we know that once the season ends for a college or NFL team, the quicker they can make the change. Now, they want to make the right move, of course. That's most important. But the quicker they can make the change, the more options they have on the open market. So they have those evaluations made. I would hope most head coaches have the evaluations in their mind, at least of their coordinators near the end of the season. So they know, Hey, you know, this guy's coaching for his life, or I've already made a decision with two games left. You know, it's just not working and I'm going to let him go as soon as the season's over. And that's why you see, of course, the day after the season, head coaches let go and then coordinators let go, even for co uh, head coaches, they retain their jobs. It's a bit curious to me that Miami didn't play in a bowl game. Mm -hmm. Their season's been over since the last Saturday of November, and here they're firing Josh Gaddis in late January. It's been almost two months since their season's been over. What's the implication, Mark? You have, I mean, you have theories behind this? off the field issues. He's got another job lined up somewhere else. And they, they know that. I mean, what do you have any I, idea? I, I don't want to speculate beyond that. I'm just calling that into question. It's not completely unheard of, but it's not the norm by any well, perhaps, stretch. Perhaps they have, and I'm not close enough to, I know you got wholesome Holloway on here all the time and, and I have chatted with him and enjoy the banter with him, but I, I wonder if maybe he's just struggled to recruit or since the end of the season. And, you know, I don't know what you, you, they've done some good in the portal. I mean, heck they got Terry Roberts from Iowa here. Now he obviously is a defensive player, but Miami's done decently well as a whole in the portal. Um, I'm sure they that, just brought uh, in the number five recruiting class in the country in 2023. Now they have had issues recruiting wide receivers. I don't know how much play well, he has into that. Well, he's a wide receivers coach. <laughs> I mean, well, that could be it. So, so that's a theory. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And, and for the record, uh, I don't think Gaddis is coming to Iowa. I, I, I just, I don't. Do I find it intriguing? Yes, that's why I tweeted this morning. Sorry, I, people control my Twitter. But I found it intriguing because of the storyline with Cade, because here's the other reason it's it's intriguing, Mark. It's just, I keep hearing all this, this positivity about how much John Budmeyer is respected within the Iowa program. And Brad Heinrichs actually said, if Brian were to move on, you know who his bet is to replace Brian? It's John Budmeyer. And I, I have nothing against John Budmeyer, but I'm thinking to myself, we, we can do better. I mean, that's resume wise. He doesn't have it. He was a QB's coach at Wisconsin. He was the OC one year at Colorado state and they weren't very good. So to me, there are better people out there, people with better resumes and like it or not uh, off the field issues aside, Gaddis has a better resume, but Here's why this would be intriguing. If I say, Brian, say we're, let's just play in La La Land for a second, uh, Mark. Say we get an announcement tomorrow, which they won't do that on a Saturday, but say we got an announcement tomorrow that Brian has been hired by the Patriots and the OC job is completely open. And then someone comes forward and, and confesses that, hey, I made that whole thing up about Gaddis and this recruit's mother. And that never happened. He's a great guy. I, you know, I, you know, I'd, I'd want my daughter to date his son, whatever. If that were to happen, I would say, hey, perhaps you entertain this for a couple of reasons, not only because of the Cade connection, but also because if you bring him in, he's a wide receivers coach, a position that they have struggled mightily at as well. They've struggled to recruit wide receivers. They've struggled to develop wide receivers. And I think Kelton Copeland is a great guy. I've heard nothing but good things about Kelton Copeland. But they have struggled at wide receiver under Kelton Copeland. They have. And they've struggled to retain receivers, Mark. 
to Charlie Jones, Arlen Bruce, Keegan Johnson. Now, a lot of people will blame Brian more than they would blame Copeland, but I'm just giving you the facts. You have an opportunity then to say, okay, we're moving Kelton out of here. We're moving Brian out of here, and we're going to hire Gaddis, and we're going to promote uh, Bud Meyer. And all of a sudden, Bud Meyer's coaching your quarterbacks. You've got Gaddis coaching wide receivers. That's a pretty feasible, and believe me, a bit, this is what Brad Heinrich said on the show Wednesday as well, that a big part of Cade coming here, he believes a big part of that was Bud Meyer. Um, Cade's brother was committed to Colorado State under Bud Meyer prior to Bud Meyer being relieved of his duties when their head coach got fired. So then his brother, I think, went to UTEP. I think that's the brother at UTEP. But my point is, that would be a pretty intriguing scenario, having Bud Meyer and Gaddis as uh you know, kind of the two most important people in Cade's coaching circle at Iowa. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't. But I'm saying that's why it's a feasible um, idea. Uh, Gaddis has never coached quarterbacks, so he's not a quarterbacks coach. So remember, Brian is, his title is quarterbacks coach and OC. So they would need a quarterbacks coach and they would probably need to move Copeland out. Now, if they lose somebody on defense, there have been rumors that Jay, Jay Neiman might be close to retirement. Then you open up numbers and you can maybe add people without having to fire people, right? So there's different things that could happen. But the bottom line is, until Brian leaves, until he leaves on his own accord, it don't matter. None of it matters. Doesn't matter. Listen, we can talk up and down about Gaddis. Doesn't matter. We can talk about Paul Christ being available. Doesn't matter. We can talk about Jim Svoboda or the the guy from Clemson or John Bud Meyer, none of it matters because until Buddy Boy leaves, this is what we have. It's what we have, Mark. They're not firing him. <laughs> we we know this. They are not firing him. So I I will I will tell you this that regardless of what happens, I stand by everything I've said over the last month that there have been there has been interest in from Brian to move on. There has been they, he has taken Phone calls, there have been, there has been interest out there. But in no way have I ever said he is gone. I've said there's a chance he leaves. And about a month ago, I said, I think there's a decent chance he leaves. That was, those are the rumblings that, that I was hearing. And it's just kind of, you know, every day I hear something different. You know, one person, I still think there's a chance he leaves, you know, and then a, a credible source says, no, there's no, he's not going anywhere. So we'll just wait and see. I, I just, uh, it's it's a sad situation, Mark. It is because you'd like to be able to make a move based on what's best for the program, and instead we're making a move based on what other franchises and organizations feel is best for their franchise or organization. You see how ridiculous that is? Yes, and, and everything that you said there is completely either in terms of the scenario feasible and all the other logic reasonable, except that Josh Gaddis has no experience as a quarterback coach, so he certainly couldn't be the quarterback's coach. Well, that's already been proven not necessarily to be. <laughs> Gaddis's case. last name is not. Yeah, Gaddis's last name yes. is not Brian. <laughs> or excuse me, it's not Ferentz. Sure. So. Uh, Erica, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your contribution. Corey, how dare you put emojis on your Twitter. Thanks for hopping on tonight, guys. Thank you for being here, Erica and everyone else. We appreciate your uh, contributions. Erica coming back with, uh, with how Brian Ferentz was acting at the bull presser. Do you think Brian really wants to stay? He seems tired of dealing with the criticism. And this really falls into the next point I was going to bring up and Maybe this is a bit off the wall thinking, but we're human beings. Would you want to be in a job where you know everywhere you go, all the interactions you have with fans, boosters, alumni, fill in the blank, regardless of what they say to your face, what's running through their minds is you're not doing a good job versus getting a fresh start going into a lesser pressure, lower pressure situation, maybe as a tight ends coach at an NFL, not, not that there's not pressure there, of course, once you, you go to the highest level, but versus being in what could be considered a comfortable situation because of your name. 
he's not going to be making close to a million a year as a tight ends coach in the NFL. So, what, I mean, what does a tight ends coach in the league even make? That's I mean, a great question. I, I you, you're right. I get what you're saying, but it's it, it's um, the thing is too, and I and I've I've gotten this. I, I have been told in the in the past year that there are some big donors that are really not happy and uh, that's that's not breaking news to anybody i think that's common sense that there'd be some some big money people that wouldn't be happy with brian continuing as the oc but i've also been told from other people that there are a lot of the people that matter the people that they're writing the big checks they're happy with eight they're happy with seven to ten to nine wins a year mark they are and and we talked about it last summer. As long as fans continue to sell out the stadium and the big donors keep giving the money, it doesn't, who cares? What social, like from, from Gary Barta's perspective and from the Iowa perspective, from Kirk's perspective, who cares if people on social media and on the message boards are upset? Why does it matter? What, what impact does it have on him? Kirk gets a bonus. Last I knew, Kirk gets a bonus for winning seven games. When he's when Brian has been criticized in the past, he's pointed back to well, we won ten games last year, and I'm sure he'll say the same thing next year. We, you know, we won eight games last year. We won our bowl game last year, and you know that's just going to be that. That is the standard here, and until there's a change from the top down, that's not the, that standard is not going to be adjusted, or at least I should say, until there's pushback from the the, the season ticket holders and from the big donors that standard will not change. So as much as fans say it's ridiculous, Brian's offense is terrible. You may be right. And I agree with you. I think you are right. But as long as Iowa keeps winning seven to nine games, there's a chance none of that matters. And that's a sad reality for the people who, you know, think that this program can do better, you know, and I do think I've said this for a long time, Mark, I I don't agree with the people that say, you need to appreciate what you have. You know, you could always be worse. You could turn into Nebraska. Um, you know, the grass isn't always greener. What's wrong with wanting to be great? What, what's wrong with that, Mark? What is wrong with wanting to be great and refusing to settle for average to good? I, I just don't agree with that. And we have seen programs fall into the cellar because they were not happy with average to good. Bo Pelini. Now, I know Bo Pelini had some serious personality issues. But the dude was winning nine games every year. wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. They got rid of him and and they went to the cellar. Now maybe Matt Rule gets him out of the cellar, but that is a risk you take. And I think everybody who pays money, whether that be as a big money donor, as a maybe a, a lower tier donor, a season ticket holder, or even the single uh, game ticket buyers, everybody who's a part of this fan base that matters, and they all matter, right? In the end, they all matter has a right to determine what do I want? That doesn't mean you get to make decisions for the university, but you have a right to your opinion that, Hey, I think we can do better. And I think we need to make a change. So I, I don't appreciate those who shame others into saying, you know, you know, you know, you shouldn't be wishing for anything. It could always be worse and be happy with eight wins, nine wins. You know, that's your opinion, but let others have this, you know, a contrary opinion because there's different perspectives on all of us. Yeah, there, there is an extreme to that. The extreme is, and I'm close to the situation because of who I root for and because of the amount of content I produce where people are calling for Ryan Day's head for going 11-2 and two and going to the playoff and losing to the eventual national champion by one point. So there are extremes to that. However, I'll bring up a program in South Carolina, Clemson, South Carolina. Think of this. At the time that Dabo Sweeney was hired as the Clemson head coach, who had a better football program, Clemson or Iowa? Iowa did. They were on the brink of winning Big Ten championships 08, 09, in that range, 10, when Dabo Sweeney was hired at Clemson. Clemson lost seven games his first year. But they made a commitment that we want to be excellent. We want to compete for national championships, and that has to start – Uh, from the top and go down. And that has to be a complete mindset that we are going for it. And Uh, by the way, Gregory in the chat, this is what I'm talking about. He says, be careful what you wish for. So I don't mind Gregory or anybody saying, I'm going to be careful what I wish for, but I, I don't know that you can, Gregory, you can't tell that to me. You can't say that to anybody. Be careful what you wish for. I'm going to wish for whatever I want to wish for Mark. (laughs) 
you know, I, we understand the potential for things to not work out. You understand, but really what it, th- this is the whole issue with the Brian situation. Like I understand some, a person saying, be careful what you wish for, you, you know, people who say, well, Kirk Ferentz needs to be fired. I think that's ridiculous. I don't agree with that. And I understand why people say, be careful what you wish for. I still think people have the right to their opinions, but I understand that. We're not talking about making a head coaching change. We're talking about making an offensive coordinator change. We're talking about an offense that's one of the worst in the country, maybe the worst, one of the worst. It's, it's There's no question about it. I know people, it's funny, the people lately who have been uh, coming to Brian's defense about, oh, it's you know, total offense is not the best metric. It's actually not as bad as we think. It's been bad these last two years. It's been awful. Has that been stated? Yes. Yes. It's, it's not stated. as bad. It's been, st- yes, 100%. And Gregory Richrod is a good example. Sure. That's another good example, right, Mark? <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that things can't go awry by making changes, but where else can you go but up? <laughs> I mean, where else can you go but up from what we've, what I was had? Corey, you made an interesting comment a few minutes back about people, high leverage people being satisfied with eight and four. I would love to get the feedback from the the chat on this, but I believe that most college football fans, i.e. Iowa football fans, are more pleased with an eight and four season versus an four and eight season, less of that is about actually watching eight winning football Saturdays versus four. And it's more about being optimistic and hopeful about the program that's producing eight wins, because if you're an eight and four team in what's the second best conference in college football, then you're more than likely when you're producing those kind of seasons, you're much closer to being a championship team. So it's less about, well, we just had eight enjoyable Saturdays this fall versus four. And it's more about, no, we're closer to being a championship caliber team. We have less to fix and there's more hope and optimism that we're close to being a championship caliber team. And that's the joy of going eight and four is because it provides more hope than being four and eight. Well, I understand. I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, Mark, sometimes like you just brought up with Clemson, sometimes the four and eight, five and seven seasons, if we're talking about a change from the top down, sometimes those are necessary to bust through the ceiling and get past the eight and four, nine, nine and three ceiling that a program like, and I know I always had 10, 10 win seasons. I get that. Are we on the same page on that? I mean, sometimes no, I think you, I, I think maybe I miscommunicated what I meant there. Um, that for a lot of people, and we've had this conversation both on the air and off enough that I think I can represent you here, that um, the, the, the eight and four is not satisfactory, but it's obviously if you're going eight and four, nine and three every year, then you're a good football team. Overall, you're a really good football team that has less to fix therefore more hope and optimism to be a championship team than Rutgers, Northwestern, et cetera, that's winning one, two, three, four football games. Right. Not just the enjoyment of that particular season going eight and four versus going four and eight. It's more about, well, we, we have a better program. Therefore, there's more hope and optimism to win championships. I agree. And, and, and part, and I did misunderstand you, so thank you for clarifying. Part of the issue here at Iowa is there is not a, I don't think there's a priority. We, we've talked about this. There's, is there really a priority to go to the college football playoff on a year in year out basis? Is there a priority to win national championships? Like, do you see that reflected? Like, I don't know that I've ever heard Kirk Ferentz say anything about our goal. We want to win a national championship. Like, I've never heard that out of his mouth. And, and, that's his prerogative. I mean, I, I, that's fine. They haven't won a Big Ten championship since 2004. Um, they've been close several times. They've been very close. Close last year, close in 09, close in 15. But but the bottom line is they haven't. And so maybe that's why he doesn't bring it up, because he knows the first hurdle is getting to the Big Ten championship game. But 
I just, you know, going back to complacency and being satisfied with where you're at, you, you have every right to feel that way. And I think some people would reason they'd say, or they defend it by saying, well, I have perspective. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of those people who are saying that are older, you know, maybe in their 50s, 60s, even 70s. And I respect their perspective because they do have perspective, right? They have more perspective than someone in their 20s or 30s. I would say also, though, sometimes that perspective can hold you back. And I think some of those fans maybe endured the Frank Lauterbur years back in the 70s when the team was awful. And so, because I've heard that, I've heard people, well, you know, you should have lived back in my day during the Frank Lauterbur years. Well, you know, it was 50, <laughs> 55 years, 50 years ago, Mark, you know, at some point you, you have to say, okay, we're, we're moving on. And yes, there's always, ri there's risk with everything. There is risk with everything. Um, and so I don't agree with that. I've made my, my stance abundantly clear, my opinion of, of what I want. I think it's, we're long overdue for a change. And by the way, I think I was, I think I was more than patient with the Brian Ferentz era. I really didn't start uh, making it clear my stance on this until last year, last season. Um, I, I said a year ago, I said, you know, let's hit the portal hard at quarterback. Let's get in somebody who can help Brian. I'm talking about a passing game coordinator. Let's get in someone who can help him with the passing game. Let's go to the court, the portal. Let's attack hard at quarterback. What did they do, Mark? They didn't attack the portal hard at quarterback. They didn't hire somebody to help Brian with the passing game. They hired an analyst and John Budmeyer, but they promoted Brian, the QB's coach. And so I, I don't, I don't feel sorry for the issues that have occurred here this year. And that's, I lost, I've lost patience with it. Um, with that being said, I saw a comment earlier from, uh, who is it that made the comment? Um, I won't pop it up here cause I know we got to get to, uh, our super chat here, but, um, okay. Now I can't find it, but, um, anyways, I'll, I'll find it here, Mark, if you want to get to the super chat first. Well, to answer your speculation about how much, uh, national championships and playoff appearances and all of that are talked about at other venues, you know, take somebody like Penn state. I, I don't think that that's brought up at every news conference, but it's talked about throughout the off season. You know, this is where we are, which is a very good football program. This is what needs to be accomplished. And I know James Franklin is fielding questions all the time about how do we get from here to here? He's got to put up with that all the time. And he meets it head on and he, he states that as a goal. He shoot puts a target on a, what was Ohio state. Now it's got to be Michigan as you know, we got to take this team down They're They're in our way and we got to win big 10 championships. Once you do that, you're gunning for national championships. Shoot. Brian day has to talk about winning every game. Almost every time he takes the podium. Yeah. And you know Nebraska's talking about it. Nebraska's talking about national championships. And I get I'm not implying that I envy three and nine Nebraska. That's not where four and eight, whatever what were they this year? They four and eight, three and nine. Four and eight. Yeah. Four and eight. The not, final not but I'm just saying there's nothing wrong with shooting for the stars. But I think some people have this mindset that be happy with what you have. Don't don't shake things up and try to get better because things could always get worse. I think that's a defeatist attitude. That's my opinion. By the way, the comment here from T. Hink, Brian Ferentz didn't have the talent this year, so Kirk Ferentz is going to give it one year with the guys coming in, and when next year comes around, if not changed, then I think the do we move on with Brian. That's likely what's going to happen, Mark. If if Brian if Brian doesn't leave now, and I'm not closing the door on that, I've been saying for weeks that I think it's still a possibility, and I stand by that. But if that indeed occurs, if they double down on Brian, that will be the narrative. And I think that might even be the belief. Like, I think Kirk actually, there's a potential that he actually believes that we've just really stunk with offensive talent over the past two years. Now, I would respond to that claim by saying, well, Kirk, who is recruiting? Uh, who is responsible for recruiting and development? I mean, it starts with your OC, right? That's part big part of why he's there and he's not been getting it done. So don't just blame the players. And that's kind of what we're doing. If that's the narrative, we're blaming the, the players Guys like Charlie Jones, who went on to be maybe the best player in the Big Ten this year, or well, one of the best receivers in the Big Ten. Arlen Bruce, who's now with Oklahoma State. Keegan Johnson, who's now at Kansas State. They've had good players, Mark. I don't buy that completely. I do think their talent level has been 
subpar over the past two years on the offensive side of the ball, especially along your offensive line. But there are reasons for that. And some of that, I think a lot of that falls on coaching, recruiting, development, all of that. So, but but I, my reason I bring that up, I think it's a good comment from, from Mr. Hink here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're thinking, hey, we, we're bringing in Cade McNamara, which they should have done last year, should have brought a quarterback in last year. We're bringing in McNamara. We're bringing in Seth Anderson from Georgia. Mark, I've been told that they're going to probably attack the portal hard again in the next window once spring ball's over, probably going to go get another receiver, at least try to go get another receiver. Um, they've got a couple guys visiting this weekend. they got Rusty Feth, the graduate transfer interior offensive lineman from Miami, Ohio, who was coached by George Barnett uh, when Barnett was at Miami. And then uh, Nick Jackson, linebacker from Virginia, who's got some huge offers out on the, on the table right now. He's visiting as well. So they're still they're trying to load up on talent. And I think even though uh, Jackson's on defense, we're talking about maybe a, a a narrative beginning to form if they can get what they want in the portal. And they've done part of it. I mean, credit to them for getting Cade McNamara. That was the starting piece. And that's huge. And I think credit to them getting Seth Anderson. I think he's a diamond in the rough, but they've had some misses and it still to me does not, it does not do the job of, of the inadequacies. It does not solve all the issues that they've had over the past two years. As I believe I stated here in the last few weeks, the season that Cade McNamara turns in is either going to be a complete indictment on Brian Ferentz and the offensive approach, or it's at least going to mask the issues that have persisted for the last several years, meaning that Cade McNamara is the first transfer quarterback, therefore the first guy that's ever stepped on campus been, who's been ready to play. From a leadership standpoint, uh, as a technician, as a quarterback, his fundamentals, his, it, he's he's a really good quarterback. He's not great. He's not one of the best in the country, but he's a top 25 quarterback in college football. He's played at Michigan for a year and a half, so he's got a track record that has shown us in a really good offense, but not a great offense, not a prolific offense, that if he doesn't turn in a low 60s to 65% completion percentage and throw well over twice as many touchdowns as picks, something that obviously we didn't see out of Spencer Petras, anything close to that, then, then their offensive approach and their inability to call the right plays, develop the other positions is dragging him down. That's that's absolutely fair. And I unfortunately think there's a decent chance that happens. I, I think there's a decent chance that, I mean, here's the deal. The offense will be better, Mark. There's no question about it. The offense will be better. If it's worse next year, I mean, if it's worse next year, then <laughs> something <laughs> went unbelievably wrong. I, and, and so just to recap for everyone, the conversation, the running conversation Corey and I had over the last offseason was how can the offense be any worse? It's just statistically almost impossible for it to be worse. However, I did bring up at one point, and Corey certainly has more knowledge on the personnel than I do. Well, statistically, I completely agree, and we were both on board with that analysis. How do you go from 129 or whatever they were, 123, how do you get any worse when we're looking at low end group of five teams that are below them? Well, you lose the best center in the country. You lose your best wide receiver. You lose arguably your best running back. Maybe you are going to be worse. Well, they were. <laughs> now I uh, give them credit, Mark. They are losing. They're not losing their best running back this year. They're returning Caleb Johnson, who really emerged as the year went on. They are losing their best offensive player in Sam Laporta, but I think they're more, there, I don't think there's any question anybody with a uh, brain would say that they're much more uh, they're, they're much more uh, competent at tight end behind Sam Laporta than they ever were at center behind Linderbaum. And I'm talking, of course, not only about Lachey, but Eric all now out of the portal. So they're in good position to somewhat compensate for what they're losing with Laporta going to the league. Um, 
they are losing Arlen Bruce. And I think a lot of people just kind of, you know, the Keegan Johnson situation is unique because he didn't play this year. I mean, he played a, a few games, didn't really, well, he played in two games, didn't really do much in either, didn't do anything against Nebraska from a pass catching standpoint. Um, but, but those guys are still losses. And Bruce was still the number one receiver this year. And yes, they didn't get him involved. But Mark, part of that is play calling. Part of that is quarterback play. Part of that is line play. I don't know that you can just say, well, it's addition by subtraction. He wasn't producing any, I mean, his numbers weren't there anyways. It's, he's not the only one in control of his numbers, Mark. Just ask Charlie Jones that question. I, I guarantee you he'd say he deserved more targets in 2021. But the point is, uh, Bruce is a loss. And they bring in Seth Anderson, who I really like. But even if we're going to argue that Seth Anderson is an even trade, they haven't upgraded. I mean, I don't know that you can make the argument that they've upgraded at wide receiver at this point. Even if we if we just concluded that Keegan Johnson, who I think is going to be a pro, I think he, I think especially at Kansas State, he's got an opportunity to be a really good receiver if he can stay healthy. And I know fans don't want to hear that, but that's just a, my opinion. I think he can be that good by bringing in uh, Seth Anderson from um, Charleston Southern. I, I just don't think that's that's enough to say we've upgraded at wide receiver. And I know that narrative is out there, but you know, if they, now if they got an Isaac to slaw, maybe we could have had that uh, discussion. He's not coming and not walking through those doors and neither is Charlie Jones. So now you got to hope on, now you got to hope for development. If you can't land somebody in the portal, which I, I, again, I think they will try again after spring, but if you can't land a big fish at receiver in the portal, you've got to hope that vines is developed or Bostic is developed or Brecht is developed, or one of the freshmen comes in and is electric because they I, I'm not confident at all at receiver right now. Um, if they can bring in Rusty Feth, then I'll say, okay, I, I, I'm a lot in a much better place comfortability-wise with the offensive line than I was back in November because Feth is a seasoned guy. Now, he is coming from the MAC. If, he, if they can land him, he's got offers from Purdue and West Virginia and some different schools. If they can land him, he's a seasoned guy but he is coming from the Mac. Dejon Parker is coming from Saginaw state, which is division two. So I think he's got great potential. He dominated at his level, but there are still question marks there, but I feel better about the line. If they can land both of those guys and yeah, the offense will be better. I mean, it will be better with Cade McInerney, but how good does it need to be? Like total offense isn't the perfect representation of what Iowa's offense is because of how they play. We, you and I would both admit this. Don Patterson's talked about this. But if we're just looking at total offense, I think they need to be at least top 75 to say they're competent. Um, and even that probably doesn't mean they're good. Um, points per game, I know, is a big part of this as well. You've got to weigh both. I had a debate with a guy the other night on my show who just was avid about how total offense means absolutely nothing. And I, I just couldn't disagree more. It does mean a lot. And you can look at red zone offense. You can look at third down conversion rate. You can look at – I mean. All these different things. I mean, it's it's clear. Just the eye test would tell you that Iowa's offense was pitifully bad these past two years. But uh, it will be better next year just because of Cade McNamara. Regardless of what happens anywhere else, he makes the offense better. But the question is, how much is the offense held down by not making staff changes that could potentially make things a lot better? Because I don't think they're far off from that, Mark. I think you can, with with, with the quarterback overhaul, and it's an overhaul. You're losing two guys and bringing two guys in. That's an overhaul in my book. Losing three guys and bringing two guys in. Um, I think that's an overhaul. With with that in place, and then you know, with uh, with some movement at wide receiver and up front, they've got a potential to make a big, big jump next year. But I just I do worry that that jump will be hampered by doubling down on the staff. Do you anticipate Spencer Petris transferring? No, doesn't sound like it. Sounds like he's uh, rehabbing. He's going to be there this spring, helping. That was the word that was used, helping Cade McNamara. So uh, I, I don't know what he's going to do in the fall. Maybe he does. I guess he could leave, right? He could leave in that next portal window. He's yeah. a graduate anyways. He can leave anytime he wants. Um, but uh, that's a great question. I think he's probably going to be here in, this, in the uh, fall, maybe as a GA. Um, I don't know. But he's here in the spring. And I, I don't know of the scholarship situation. I'm assuming he's going to be occupying a scholarship. Um, if he's occupying a scholarship in the fall, I'm going to 
kind of furrow my brow a bit because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me for a guy who th- doesn't have any chance of playing and who's been here for you know four plus years already. Why is he still taking up a scholarship? But my guess is they'll find a way for him to um, be on staff in some capacity if he doesn't have aspirations to play. Kirk Ferentz, back in December, made it sound like Spencer was planning on you know, trying to impress some team in the NFL and get into a camp, but he can't do that with a torn labrum recovering from a torn labrum and a surgery. So I assume by how he, how he talked about it, that you're going to get Petrus back in the spring, maybe in the fall, and he may try to throw next spring and get some interest from an NFL team, but maybe, you know, he's, he's an, he's a bright kid. So maybe he wants to go play somewhere else in the fall and, you know, they probably had a level down. I, I, I would guess and then move on with his life. So I don't know. I'm going to answer that question. You did see that Alex Padilla committed to SMU. I'm assuming you saw that. So he's, that's an interesting landing spot, Mark. Tanner Mordecai was uh, more than competent at SMU. Didn't he have a 10 touchdown day uh, earlier this season, this past year? Yeah, I believe against Houston. It was some crazy 77-63 game. Red Lashley. Uh, who coordinated offenses most recently at Miami and had the aforementioned offensive coordinator job prior to Josh Gaddis at Miami that produced Tyler Van Dyke, who was the freshman of the year in the ACC, is the head coach at SMU and known for uh, offensive scheming. One Scoop John, appreciate you being here. Kirk is committing malpractice, keeping Brian Ferentz when Josh Gaddis, Paul Christ are free agents. Most of Iowa's points are scored on defense. Like, subscribe, and join Patreon. Go to patreon.com, search Mark Rogers TV, join the Discord, and join the uh, knuckleheads, the self-proclaimed knuckleheads, talking college football right there. I was going to say real quick about Alex Padilla. Is that surprise you that Padilla, given what you know about Padilla, you've watched him on a number of occasions. Does he fit into what SMU does offensively? Or does that surprise you that he would transfer there? It surprised me a bit. Like that's, they are a pass first offense, right? I mean, are they? Would, oh yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that, that just, I don't know. That's intriguing. So does he start down there? Do you know their quarterback situation with Mordecai going to Wisconsin? I he's got a shot. don't. Uh, something tells me that they picked up somebody else, but I, I can't um, can't put my my finger on who that was. Well, unlike they, Iowa, they played their backups this year willingly, so their backups got some time. So they've got guys with tape, and they'll, I'm sure they'll. Ba- I wish I wish Alex Padilla all the best. That'll be a lot different going from Iowa City to Dallas. I can tell you that. I just got back from Dallas a few weeks ago, and uh, that was the one stadium I didn't get to was SMU. Um, which I kind of wanted to, but best wishes to to Alex. He probably wants to play somewhere warmer. And boy, I, I <laughs> could you imagine if he goes down there? I don't think he's gonna. I don't think he's the next Charlie Jones by any means at his position. But imagine if he goes down there and puts up big numbers. That will be very very odd. But they are again air raid style offense. They're going to throw the ball a lot. And uh, Mordecai Tanner Mordecai, the SMU transfer going to Wisconsin. That will be. I mean, they got an interesting competition up there between Evers and Mordecai. Um, they, think they, landed, they landed the third guy. Didn't they have a third guy out of the portal as well at quarterback? Quarterback? I was thinking. I'll have to look this up. I thought up. it was just those two. But but they're, they're an interesting one, as is Nebraska. Both teams have been very... Very productive in the portal, and they need to when you're when you're dealing with the head coach. Yeah. And, and Nebraska is going to have a quarterback battle, and we thought they had a competent one in Casey Thompson, but they brought in another starter. Yeah, Jeff Sims at Georgia Tech. Braden is it Braden Locky from uh, or Lock from uh, Mississippi State transferred to? Okay. Uh, oh. Yeah, he was a backup. Yeah, but they're. I play. mean, talk about a, a quarterback. Uh, overhaul up there with and then Graham Mertz is uh uh Florida yes <laughs> so <laughs> it's just interesting it'll be interesting yeah. to see how all this plays out and of course Deacon Hill you talk about Wisconsin Deacon Hill coming to Iowa yeah <laughs> so he's an intriguing one as well had his uh had his old high school coach on on the show on Wednesday as well and of course he's he raves about Deacon Hill maybe a little bit biased but he thinks that uh, Deacon can be Really, really good. I mean, I read a little bit of, uh, you know, when he was coming out of high school down in Santa Barbara, he had some big schools after him. I think UCLA offered um, 
Deacon Hill, and of course, Wisconsin him going to the, being a Badger, um, has a really big arm, known for having a big arm. It'll be interesting to see. Like, I mean, if Cade McNamara goes down, you know, who, who's the backup? Is it, you know, it, it's going to be a battle for for 2023 between probably Labus and uh, Deacon Hill. And then, of course, Linez gets there in the, in the summer as well. So that's an interesting, much different looking quarterback room. So regardless of what happens with Brian, Mark, it will be intriguing to see quarterback competition wise how that all plays out. Lemansky, thanks for being here. Hi, USC Tim. Would you call Gary Barda? AD Gary Barda. Gary Barda forgot USC and UCLA are on the way. He looks at his retirement age and not on the changes in college football. Well, I, I've said my 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 thoughts on the conference expansion and, and whatnot is that's a, a further reason to make a big change now, not then, right? Not after Wisconsin and Nebraska have, have gotten a chance a year into being established, reestablished, you know, USC and UCLA, because they're joining next year, right, Gary? Or, right, uh, yeah. Mark? I'm not, yeah. Can't I'm not wait. imagining that. They're joining <laughs> after this next season. So it's very, it's going to be here before you know it. And <laughs> it's just going to be a weird, it's a weird couple of years in Iowa football. I mean, Big Ten history books is, is just going to be a weird couple of years. Yeah. When you look at whatever you, you would consider to be the pecking order of programs in the big 10, it just got much deeper with those two on board. So if you're in the Iowa, Minnesota category, wow, you, you need to step up your game. If you want to stay in that upper echelon of the conference. Uh, so P uh, Ferris says that Petrus transferred. No, no, he didn't transfer. He's, he's still on the roster. Uh, yes. Uh, he is still on the roster Cole. And again, as I said earlier, he's uh, sounds like he's going to be helping Cade McNamara as he rehabs from shoulder surgery that he had just recently. Uh, one scoop, John here, Mark, can I throw up a comment here? Sure. Uh, thank you for the super chat Cole, but, uh, your thoughts on this based on what you know about the rest of the conference. He says, and this is a Michigan fan. He says, I was positioned to win the big 10 with, with coaching changes. Um, I can already tell you don't agree with that statement, but I'm just curious what, like how, how good could Iowa be if you make them say you hired, uh, let me go Gaddis. Cause I know Gaddis, there's different opinions on Josh Gaddis. Say you hired the guy from, who's the guy that just got fired from Clemson here a couple of weeks ago, Brandon Streeter Streeter. Say you hired Streeter. Say, say you, you got Streeter and, uh, and you know, what makes us believe that Brandon Streeter is a good offensive coordinator? because he was at Clemson, but he was there for a year. He was he was there with a, a, a lesser position. I think he was quarterback's coach was before quarterback's that. Coach. Yeah. He was a quarterback's coach. They were still, I mean, they were still, what, third in the ACC in offensive efficiency. I get they have a lot of talent down there. Um, But it's kind of like the Gattis situation. Like, we're, we're measuring this. This is all relative. Like, performance is all relative. Gattis, what he did at Miami, uh, rankings-wise, you look at stats, has – blows Brian Ferentz's offense out of the water. And you'd say the sure. same thing about Streeter. And I know, again, apples to oranges are talking about different talent levels and whatnot. But I'm just saying, if you can make a decent hire, would there be a better example of it? Who else is out there, Mark, that Iowa could go after besides Voboda and Christ and Streeter and Gaddis? Who else would be a, a really, really solid hire at OC if Brian leaves? There might be somebody in the NFL. I don't think you should limit yourself to college football. Now you're not most likely going to get an offensive coordinator from the NFL. How about Joe Philbin? How about Joe Philbin? He just got fired by the Last Cowboys. Was he passed. Hey, well, he was the old line coach down in Dallas. He just got fired from the Cowboys a couple of days ago. He's an old buddy of Ken O'Keefe's and, and Kirk Ferentz. Remember, Ken O'Keefe went down to Miami to work with Philbin when Philbin was the head coach down there. You got offensive line problems. Maybe hire Philbin as your OC. <laughs> so, I mean, Say you hired, say, let's just be, they hired Joe Philbin. All right. Brian moves on. You hire Joe Philbin. They add a really, you know, they add a solid receiver after spring practice. That means two wide receivers in the portal. Um, let's say they land Rusty Feth. They land Nick Jackson from Virginia because they need some help at linebacker, but you trust what Phil Parker's doing. CJ Stroud is gone at Ohio State, right? Um, 
you know, Michigan's going to be right there again next year. I don't think there's any question about it. I do wonder how long can Harbaugh continue to flirt with the NFL and not, I don't know, hurt his relationship with people there in Michigan. I, I, I don't know how that happens. But anyways, where do you see Iowa in the grand scheme of things? If those changes were, were just, again, playing make-believe here, what, where would you perceive Iowa to, to finish? Uh, Ohio State still has the best roster in the conference. Michigan's the best team. They're the most proven team, and with what they have coming back, yeah. they are the most proven team. Uh, Penn State, I don't want to call them a wild card because they're certainly going to be a very good team, but as a championship-level team in that conference and getting past the the big two, they're a bit of a wild card in that Drew Aller uh, is the new quarterback, and he's a five-star out of Medina, Ohio, and he he has exceptional talent. Now, making yeah. the leap and, and being the right. guy is a different deal, but Penn State is certainly well-equipped to be a Big Ten champion this year. But now, none of that matters. N n none of that matters because, because of the Western division. Yeah. Iowa sure. doesn't play Ohio State. They don't play Michigan. They're in the West. So I think there's no question. Even with uh, this is the scary thing. Even without Brian, even with Brian Ferentz still on the roster, they've got a pretty good shot to win the West next year. Oh, they can win the West. We reviewed the schedule uh, a few weeks ago, and then you yeah. just have to steal one game. So I think they're the if you make if you were to make that type of a jump, like you hire Joe Philbin, he's your next OC. You you uh, bring in some ad, more ads in the portal. You're, I think, unquestionably the favorite in the Big Ten West. I mean, I don't think there's been a year, Mark, that I can remember. Maybe 2016, and they, of course, didn't win it in 2016. But other than 2016, I don't think there's been a year where you'd look at Iowa and say they are, without question, the Big Ten West favorites. Whereas there have been years since the divisions were formed where we've said that about Wisconsin. I don't believe that's happened maybe more than once with Iowa. But I think Iowa is unquestionably, with the changes at Nebraska, the change at Wisconsin, the change at Purdue, they're unquestionably the favorites. Minnesota would be there. Illinois would be there. And I still think Wisconsin will be a player. But I think they're the favorites to win the West with that change. And like you said, then you got to still one game. The schedule is favorable to a point where you don't have to play Ohio State or Michigan. Penn State's in the schedule. But as you mentioned, going through a quarterback change, Drew Aller, obviously very decorated high schooler, but hasn't done it at this level. You're, you're losing Sean Clifford, who's been there forever. Um, so I just, you know, I just think this is an opportunity, not only because you're preparing for the divisions to go bye-bye and for UCLA and USC to join the conference in a year, but you got an opportunity. You got a window here, a potential one-year window where you can slam dunk this division and perhaps steal a Big Ten championship game. And I think that's that's another aspect of my frustration of this attitude. Well, let's just wait and see what Brian does with a little bit more talent. Um, that's why I'm not satisfied with that answer. We may find out this year how good Luke Fickle is. Which, which even if he goes seven and five, of course, that's not going to be an indictment against him that he's not a tremendous coach because it's his first year. He's figuring things out. But don't be surprised if Wisconsin doesn't that's what I say. Like the the mat, and especially the era of the transfer portal. I understand you can't just go full bore in the transfer portal and expect to build a, a program in a year. However, Mark, development and growth of a program, building a program can be can be put on an accelerated track by means of the transfer portal. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Look at what yeah. USC did last year. Good lord. Well, a little bit different, right? We're 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 comparing USC and Wisconsin, right? But, but name wise, Luke Fickle, I mean, he was one of the biggest names out there. And, and you probably could not have done better hiring a head coach than Luke Fickle. I mean, just from, I, I think he's the safest hire. I think he gives you probably more potential for a, a higher ceiling than just about anybody else that would have been on the market. Um, so I'm just saying within a year, with the portal and with everything in place now and with his track record, is there any reason to think that they can't have things mostly built by 2024? And here's, here's another thing. I mean, Scott Frost was a joke at Nebraska. We get that, 
But we all wondered when Paul Christ was fired during this past season, we all wondered, how can you do that? He's been winning nine games a year at Wisconsin, eight, nine games a year at Wisconsin. How do you do that to a guy like that? Could that have potentially been part of the discussion? Hey, we got to make a move now so we give our next coach time to prep for the new era of the Big Ten, which is coming. That is, We, a, we I, had that conversation, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that wasn't part of the, the mindset from <laughs> absolutely Chris McIntosh and that administration. Yes. We need to give our next guy, whoever it is, whether it's Jim Leonard. I, don't, I honestly believe they, don't, they didn't know who it was going to be. Yes. I think they gave Jim Leonard an audition. Absolutely. Work out to what they thought, and you go with Luke Fickle. But they wanted to give their next guy adequate time to build and prepare for the new era of college football. And if Iowa doubles down on Brian Ferentz, regardless of the slight marginal boost that they have in overall offensive talent, if you double down with Brian Ferentz and the rest of this staff as is and make no other changes, no other, no other significant changes, my fear is that Iowa is missing that opportunity to build for the future. And you could argue in a year it might be too late to do that and you're you're trying to tread upstream, if you will. Yeah, Wisconsin and Iowa, from a approach standpoint, are viewed as being attached at the hip, that they're like programs, and in many ways, that stereotype is well-founded. Uh, and, and Wisconsin has always hired head coaches since Barry Alvarez, who have fallen in line with being Wisconsin guys to a certain extent. Of course, Brett Bielema went to Iowa, but they had time in the program at Wisconsin or were Wisconsin products as players. And that's how they've fallen in line. Now they broke from that mold with this move with Luke Fickle. Exactly. That was my take on the situation from the time it, from the time Jim Paul Chris was fired, even before Fickle, when Leonard was hired, and, and moved into that position with all that season left, I thought and stated it many times, this is his audition and they're going to make a determination whether Jim Leonard is ready for this and he's going to take us into the new era of the Big Ten or we now have the ability to go out there and get the best coach on the market. And they did. They did. Yeah. I mean, if I'm a Wisconsin fan, I'm feeling pretty darn good with, with where my program is. Um, and I think there were some initial shock waves that went through some some people um, of, of not really understanding what's going on. But I, I don't think many I didn't expect them to be able to land Luke Fickle. I, I just didn't expect that to happen. Um, but again, I don't think I, I don't think Wisconsin rolled the dice necessarily. I think they just said, hey, you know, we've got a, a guy who's older and Paul Christ. We think there's a ceiling under what we got here. We love Paul Christ. Great guy. But there's a ceiling here. We need to get a young guy in here who, I mean, Jim Leonard was not proven as a head coach, but certainly had a resume um, and build for the future. Uh, and so given what Leonard, uh, what Lick, uh, Fickle has done here early via the transfer portal, I'm feeling pretty good about his ability to recruit and get talent to Madison. Tanner Mordecai, 65% completion percentage last year, 3,500 yards, 33 touchdowns, 10 picks, 39 touchdowns the season prior. You know, I'm not implying that, that Alex Padilla is going to go down there and start and do that. I'm not saying that, but it's an interesting change. I mean, think about the offensive change from Iowa to SMU, and I know it's a different level, but the American is the sec I mean, the American is the sixth best conference in the country. So it's not like going to, you know, it's not even like going to the MAC. Uh, it's th no. this is a a good level of football. Now they're losing some teams, right? They're losing Cincinnati, but Cincinnati they'll be there. They're there until the following year, correct? Are yes. they there? Who? No, they're coming in this year. That's why the Big 12 okay. schedule has not been released yet. They have all four of those teams coming in right. this year. Yeah. yeah I, I I always get confused of, the, of how that's all happening. So they are losing some teams from that conference. But, heck, I mean, East Carolina has proven to be a pretty consistent East Carolina. They're, in the they're, they're losing their three best teams. They are. Yeah, but East Carolina is solid. SMU, SMU has been solid. Yeah, um, Navy, so, Memphis. Yeah. Now, if if we're sizing up the schedules between Iowa and Wisconsin, to your point, Iowa avoids the big two. However, they travel to Penn State, correct? I believe that's correct. 
And Wisconsin faces Ohio State at home. And their other two Eastern Division games are Rutgers and Indiana. So you could you could wait traveling to Penn State and taking on Ohio State at home as I am going to roughly assume, the same difficulty. I am going to assume that there will still be growing pains under Luke Fickle for the first year. Yeah, I have maybe I'm expecting too much, but I'm just saying, no. don't be surprised if he just doesn't step in and what what coach has done that? Has there been any example of a coach via the transfer portal at a major program like Wisconsin stepping in and in year one winning their division? Has that happened Lincoln, anywhere in the country? Lincoln Riley. Okay, USC. other than uh, other than USC, has that happened anywhere? Because USC, I just think, is such a anomaly. Well, 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 the transfer portal has only really been humming here for three off seasons. True. I think that's a tall ask. You might be right. It's a weak division relative to the Big Big Ten East, um, but I just think it will. There will be some growing pain. So I'm assuming when I say I think Iowa is the odds-on favorite, especially if there's a change at OC, I'm assuming that there will be some growing pains for. Um, well, yeah. There's your guy right there, Sonny Dykes. TCU. Yeah, but, yeah, that's that's true. Five and seven college football playoff. Yeah, you're right. That's that's a good example. So now I, I've told you my opinion on Sonny Dykes. I I wonder if, how sustainable that is. Whereas Fickle, um, like I said, I think he's a safe. Long... Sonny Dykes when he got hired there, did you view that as a slam dunk for no. TCU? No, I, I don't. I mean, I don't remember thinking that was a great hire when when he got there. But and, and if anyone did, they would have to show us how they made that statement at the time of the hire, uh, yeah. because his track record showed us that he had one Power Five job that was at Cal, and it was largely a failure. He had two Group of Five jobs at Louisiana Tech and SMU that weren't over the top outstanding, but they were. You know, he did a nice job. One sixty some percent of his games. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, I by the way, I went back and watched. I watched your interviews with Sonny Dykes after you told me you had him on the oh, show. Okay, Boy, watched him. It's been a while. He was. Uh, well, I didn't know you went to. You went to AAC Media Days. Yes, I did a few times. A few times. Yeah. What do you mean a few? What do you mean a few times? They were close, it, so I went. Where was it? They were in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's that American. So that that's a really wide. It's a really big regionality, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just incredible. Well, because of the way the conference formed, their offices were in Connecticut. Okay, so that's why you. I, I wondered. And, I'm like and, that. And, and, and Rhode Island's close. Yeah. And you had them on. As you actually had them on. Uh, did you actually Here. have him on? I had him on yeah. from from yeah. from a distance a few times, but I also interviewed him there as well. Yeah, yeah, you did a good job in that setting, by the way, Mark. You you, you you're definitely natural at uh, both lines of of uh, of the sports media. So I appreciate it. All right, really good show tonight, as always. Uh, we appreciate Corey for making this happen. Get on over to from the Hawkeye of the Storm to check out Corey's work on a daily basis. Uh, what uh, do you have going on over there to uh, tell us about? Iowa basketball's on a two-game losing streak, but uh, obviously two very difficult games going to Columbus to play Ohio State and then, of course, to uh, Michigan State to play East Lansing. So they'll get Rutgers back at home on Sunday. Uh, we'll have post-game coverage for that. We'll continue to, to talk about the, the storylines of Iowa football. I've got, uh, we've got a guest coming next week, early next week for the podcast. So stay tuned for that. And final thing I'll say, Mark, before we, before we say sayonara, um, I just want to, for the people who are late coming here, don't close the door yet on Brian Ferentz leaving. Do I think he's leaving? At this point, I'd say probably not. At this point, like I say, three weeks ago, I would have said, yeah, probably is. And the more and more time goes by and the more and more I hear rumblings that he's not going anywhere, I, I lose faith. But I'm just saying, I don't think the people who are saying it's it's a done deal, he's not going anywhere. I don't think you can say that yet. Let's just wait and see. Let's wait and see what Kirk Ferentz does. Once he schedules a press conference, that would indicate to me that it's a done deal. 
they have determined that there's either movement or there's no movement, and we'll find out from Kirk himself. But until that press conference comes, I'm leaving the door open even a little bit <laughs> that there's still a potential, even though we're close to February, that we could potentially see one or more staff changes. But we're, we're again, we're depend- it sounds like we're de- completely dependent on another organization hiring a coach that has a resume of a guy who probably should be relieved of his duties. That's the reality. Chuck, thank you so much for the super chat contribution. We appreciate that, Chuck. And uh, I will let everyone know that we've got a West Virginia show coming up at 8 o'clock Eastern time over on the main channel or the West Virginia channel. Take your pick. And also, I'm going to re- be releasing my 1 through 131 rankings for 2022, which typically come out much closer to the end of the season. But um, we finally got those done So we are going to run through those with everyone and take your calls at 9 p.m. Eastern time tonight on the main channel. So we would love for you to chime in with uh, your feedback on my 1 through 131 rankings and see where the Hawkeyes landed in the final rankings. All right, Corey, thank you so much for making this happen. We will be back here hopefully next Tuesday night as usual, 430 Central, everyone. Sounds good, sir. Thank you, Mark.